Good afternoon. My name is Karen Coney. I'm the director of the Viralist Centre for Art and Politics. And on behalf of the New School, I'd like to welcome you to the New School and thank you for joining us for this conversation on the Jewish-American relationships with Israel at a crossroads. This is a pivotal moment. Our conversation happens within a few weeks of the US presidential elections and it takes place here at the New School, whose university in exile provide a refuge to Jewish scholars fleeing from Nazi Germany. There is no better time and no better place for this current conversation. When the Viralist Center for Art and Politics was founded 20 years ago, the culture wars raged, and we organized frequent and public debates about art, freedom of speech, and public funding for the arts. I propose that today, when we turn to art, we see an even more diversified spectrum of issues that artists are invested in. Among them is the historic relationship between Jewish Americans and Israel. This is why the Viralist Center is particularly proud to help provide a platform for this necessary conversation. My deep thanks go to a panel of extraordinarily qualified speakers, both those who are here, and they are Anna Balzer, Adam Schatz and Norman Finkelstein, and the one who can't be here, Noam Chomsky, whose work has been instrumental in laying the ground for us today and whom we wish a speedy recovery. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the New School, Laura Auricchio, Chair of Humanities, and Laura Stoller in the Department of Anthropology, both of whom are sponsors of the program, Pamela Tillis, Director of Public Programs, Sam Biederman, Communications and External Affairs, Tom Illicito, Director of Security, Mark Fitzpatrick, Director of Media Studies, and Annie Shaw at the Verilis Center for Art and Politics. I'd also like to thank Or Books, partners in this event, particularly Colin Robinson and Fern Diaz. And I'd like to mention that uh, some of the books uh, authored by our panelists are available for sale and can be signed outside after this event. A couple of words on the procedure. In your programs, you will find a note card. We encourage you to write your question on these cards, which will be, which will be collected by our ushers in the first half hour of this program. And um, at the end of the presentations, Adam Schatz, our moderator, will discuss a selection of these questions with the panelists. Before Adam introduces the panelists, let me introduce him. He is the editor of Prophets Outcast, a century of dissident Jewish writing about Zionism and Israel. He is a senior editor at the London Review of Books and a former literary editor with The Nation, and has worked at the New York Times Book Review, Lingua Franca, and The New Yorker. Schatz has reported from Lebanon and Algeria for the New York Review of Books and has contributed numerous articles on politics, culture, and music to The Nation, The New York Review of Books, The Village Voice, American Prospect, and The New York Times. And now please join me in welcoming Adam. Thank you very much, Karen, for that uh, lovely introduction. I want to thank uh, Karen uh, Quoney of the uh, Vera List Center, and also Colin Robinson and John Oakes of OR Books. The American Jewish romance with Israel is both ordinary and extraordinary. American Jewish concern over Israel isn't so very different from the long distance nationalism of Cuban Americans, Irish Americans, Indian Americans, and indeed Palestinian Americans who live physically in the States, but virtu virtually or vicariously over there. But the differences are no less important and make this, I think, a special case. For one thing, very few American Jews are of Israeli origin. Israel has always been, in some sense, a projection screen for American Jews, a phantasmagorical region of the mind as much as an actual country. Another more salient distinction is the exceptional position that Israel occupies in American foreign policy. Israel is America's closest ally in the region, apart from Saudi Arabia. In spite of its small population, the Jewish state is by a considerable margin the biggest recipient of US aid, $3 billion annually. Israel is also an occupying power. 
born of a war in which two-thirds of the indigenous population was driven from their land, Israel went on to expand its borders still further in 1967 when it conquered the West Bank and East Jerusalem, the Gaza Strip, and the Golan Heights. Today, there are half a million Jewish settlers in the occupied territories who enjoy all manner of state subsidies and privileges, while Palestinians under occupation suffer indignities and humiliations too numerous to mention. The situation is not that much better for Palestinian citizens in Israel, who are increasingly treated as a fifth column, despite their loyalty to a state that has shown them little affection over the years. Israel's occupation is the longest in modern history, and the Israeli government appears to be in no hurry to end it, particularly if it can change the topic to Iran's nuclear program or the threat of Islamism. Unconditional support for Israel is not the only reason the United States is viewed with suspicion and hostility in much of the Arab and Muslim world, but it is certainly one of the reasons, and a very big one. So the American-Jewish relationship with Israel is of considerable geopolitical significance, and one does not have to buy into specious and indeed anti-Semitic notions of Jewish power to see that American Jews have played an important role in establishing the parameters of discussion of what can and cannot be said on this subject, and arguably in, in shaping America's policy in the region. The best known example of such influence is the so-called Israel Lobby, which has been an unconditional supporter of the settlement enterprise and of Israel's many wars. And now that lobby is very hard at work stirring up panic about the Iranian nuclear program. The lobby does not speak for most American Jews, but it has been successful in bullying its critics to the point where it has convinced many, if not most people, that we stand united behind Israel, right or wrong. So much for the joke that if you get two Jews in a room, you have three opinions. The idea of unanimous and unconditional Jewish support for Israel has always been a myth. As Norman Finkelstein, one of our panelists, points out in his new book, Knowing Too Much, the American Jewish romance with Israel was fostered by the 1967 war when Israel became a key US ally and by the emergence of Holocaust memory. It is a product, in other words, of politics and history, not of something primordial and static. And some of the most eloquent critics of Israeli policy, and indeed of Zionism itself, have been Jews, such as Henry Siegman, Tony Judd, our distinguished guests, not to mention Hannah Arendt and I of Stone. This is by no means an accident. The fit between Israel and American Jews with their strong traditions of liberalism and universalist ethics was never a natural one. Jewish liberal supporters of Israel had to look past or deny its unappetizing human rights record. But that has become much harder and harder to do. Norman Finkelstein argues in his new book that American Jews simply know too much now and that in the battle for American Jewish hearts and minds, liberalism is winning out over Zionism. Norman has been making this argument for some time, but it is now being echoed in a different key by establishment figures like Peter Beinart, Roger Cohen, and hold your groans, Thomas Friedman. Is this the end of the romance? I'm not sure. Support for Israel has long been one of the three walls of what the French Jewish writer Jean Daniel has called the Jewish prison, the others being Holocaust memory and the idea of being the chosen people. But there's no doubt that we are seeing an important and very encouraging explosion of debate among Jews around the question of Israel, which is, of course, also the question of Palestine. For there is, for all intents and purposes, only one real state from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. The work of activist groups like Jewish Voice for Peace and of websites like Mondo Weiss and Open Zion have been very effective in demonstrating that Jews do not speak with one voice on the Middle East. And what I think is particularly exciting is that a growing number of young Jewish Americans on college campuses are joining forces with Palestinians and Arab Americans. They understand that the fate of Israel, Palestine, can't just be a conversation among Jews. I don't want to strike too optimistic a note. We may be seeing not so much the end of the romance 
as a growing diversification of American Jewish opinion. But after years of enforced conformity, it is a very welcome development, and it may yet create the conditions for new alliances and for a more concerted campaign against the occupation. It's my honor to introduce two speakers who have devoted themselves to the cause of peace and justice in Israel-Palestine. Speaking out on this issue has never been easy and has more often than not been a thankless task. It requires courage, even fearlessness, a willingness to make enemies, and to endure all manner of insult, including the cheapest and most obvious, the charge of anti-Semitism or self-hatred, which effectively amounts to excommunication. Norman Finkelstein, the son of parents who survived the Warsaw Ghetto, is a political scientist and the author of numerous books, including Image and Reality of the Israel-Palestine Conflict and his recently published Knowing Too Much, which has provided us with the topic of today's discussion. He first came to prominence in the 1980s with his devastating critique of Joan Peters' widely praised From Time Immemorial. Through a highly selective use of Ottoman uh, demographic records, Peters had claimed that Palestine's Arab majority was not indigenous but had been attracted to Palestine by opportunities created by Jewish settlers. Thanks to Norman's forensic critique, that book is now understood to be a work of historicide, as credible as Holocaust revisionism. At a time when dissent on Israel was rare and harshly punished, Norman was willing to say what others did not dare to, and he has paid a heavy price, but he has continued to speak his mind and made it easier for others to do so. He and I have had our differences, mostly about matters of tone rather than substance, but I've always had deep respect for his work on Palestine, and I want to pay tribute here to his courage, to his commitment, and to the ethical vision that I believe underlies his work. Anna Baltzer, our other distinguished guest, is the national organizer with the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation and the co-founder of the St. Louis, Palestine, St. Louis Palestine Solidarity Committee and St. Louis Jewish Voice for Peace. The granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, Anna first came into an awareness of the Palestinian question on a backpacking trip to the Middle East in 2003 when she met Palestinian refugees from the 1948 war. Justice in Palestine is now her life's cause. She is the author of Witness in Palestine, a Jewish American woman in the occupied territories. She has made numerous television appearances, including an electrifying one, which I'm sure many of you saw, on The Daily Show with Dr. Mustafa Barghouti. In 2009, Anna received the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee's Rachel Corey Peace and Justice Award and a certificate of commendation from the governor of Wisconsin for her commitment to justice in Israel-Palestine. She has given more than 500 lectures at churches, mosques, synagogues, and universities throughout the world, and she's barely 30 years old. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers. Well, thank you for coming out. Is it sound okay? In the last row, raise your hand if you hear me clearly. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for coming out this afternoon. I'd like to thank Adam for those very generous words. Uh, my publisher, Colin, who pretty much dreamt up this idea. Uh, his colleagues, as it's called, um, Fern, Crystal, and I'm not sure if Courtney's here, but if she's here, all in spirit, I want to thank her. Uh, and most of all, I want to thank Anna, for whom I have really the highest regard. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking around the country, and I always ask the question, who's been here before me or who's coming after me? 
And literally, every single place I go, the answer is always Anna Bolzer. Regrettably, there are very few other names. Uh, and of course, I'm as disappointed as everybody in the room, and probably more so that Professor Chomsky didn't make it. And at the moment, or initially, I was pretty deflated, and the thought of having to fill his shoes, I told Fern, was like Charisse trying to fill Whitney Houston's shoes. <laughs> Fern was rather shocked that I knew who Charisse was. <laughs> I tried to impress the younger generation. Uh, but after the moments of deflation, uh, ego deflation, to be more specific, uh, I had to keep reminding myself that what I'm doing and what I have done is not about ego, ego gratification. And sometimes those things are forgotten, that you have to keep your eyes on the prize. And the prize is a suffering people who just haven't deserved and don't deserve the fate that's been delivered to them. Uh, so I'm sure uh, Professor Chomsky would want that we do our best to focus on what's important, namely the people of Palestine. I want to start my remarks this afternoon with a simple distinction. There is an Israel lobby on the one hand and there is a Jewish ethnic bloc on the other. The two entities, they often overlap, and the lobby's clout obviously grows out of the Jewish community's support for Israel. But they are not the same, and conflating the two creates a lot of confusion. So, if a Jewish professor at Columbia Law School writes a journal article defending the legality of Israeli settlements, it's almost certainly not because the lobby ordered or even prodded the professor, but because of the professor's personal identification with the Jewish state. It's not a conspiracy. It's just ethnic chauvinism. However, whereas it's almost guaranteed that the Israel lobby will back the Israeli government's current policies, whatever they happen to be, and however indefensible they might be, that's after all what lobbies for foreign governments do. Still, there's no guarantee that the Jewish community will reflexively support these policies. The backing of American Jews for Israel has historically been conditional and it's been circumstantial. It's been shaped by three factors, ethnicity, citizenship, and ideology. Plainly, if American Jews support Israel in much higher percentages and with much greater fervor than most Americans, it's because Israel calls itself a or the Jewish state, and Jews consequently feel a sense of kinship with it. The problem is that most analyses of the American Jewish relationship with Israel begin and end there. If you're Jewish, it's assumed that you more or less uncritically support Israel because of the blood bond. But in reality, that hasn't been the case. From Israel's founding in 1948 until the June 1967 war, American Jews displayed very little interest in Israel. After World War II, unprecedented opportunities opened up for American Jews. The barriers to Jewish ambition fell away. As Irving Kristol put it, suddenly see, things seemed possible that hitherto had seemed utterly impossible. Jews set their sights on making it, as Norman Podhoritz crudely boasted, in America. 
while that political and cultural backwater called Israel left most Jews cold. What's more, because Israel asserted itself to be the state of the Jews, it threatened to revive the bogey of dual loyalty that has historically haunted Jews. The last thing Jews wanted as they ascended the ladder of success, realizing the American dream, the very last thing they wanted was for their loyalty to America to be called into question. It was all the more reason to keep Israel at arm's length. So, if you do as I did one year, and you thumb through the pages of Commentary Magazine, the flagship publication of the American Jewish establishment, during the years preceding the June 1967 war, when Pud Horowitz was the editor-in-chief, you'll discover in the pages of Commentary there is barely a mention of Israel. In fact, in those days, before June 1967, one would even come across articles by Lucy Dowidowicz, who later became the arbiter of Holocaust correctness and a staunch apologist for Israel, articles in which she denounces, and now I'm quoting her, the massacres of Arabs resulting from Israeli state policy. Everything changed after the June 1967 war when Israel became, in Pud Horowitz's phrase, the new religion of American Jews. After its lightning victory, Washington upgraded Israel's status to a strategic American asset. Jewish support for Israel, it no longer threatened to conjure dual loyalty. On the contrary, it now connoted super loyalty as Israeli Jews defended on the front lines American interests, even Western civilization, against the communist third world Arab hordes. The Jewish state's martial prowess became a source of pride for Jews, for whom at that time, the primary association of the Nazi Holocaust, to the extent that it triggered any association, was of Jews going like sheep to slaughter. The image Israel projected of itself also resonated with the robust liberalism of American Jewry. Like the pioneers conquering the American wilderness, Israel had made the desert bloom. It was the only democracy in the Middle East. It was the light unto the nations. It was home to the micro-utopia of the kibbutzim. In the past three years, excuse me, in the past three decades, however, the uplifting image of Israel has withered, and concomitantly, so has American Jewish support for Israel. It is not so much that Israel has changed, although it has changed mostly, if not entirely, for the worse. Rather, it's that American Jews, who are highly literate, know much more. Indeed, at this point, they know too much. American Jews can no longer reconcile their liberal beliefs with, to borrow a phrase from the Soviet era, really existing Zionism. It could fairly be said until quite recently, most scholarship on Israel read like Leon Uris's Exodus with footnotes. To take one example, it was a truism that all the wars Israel fought were in self-defense. But current scholarship reveals a very different picture. In his monumental study, Defending the Holy Land, Ze'ev Maoz, who was formerly the head of the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University, it's a very large volume, and the essence of the volume, there's some original work, but the essence of the volume is he surveys the whole gamut of mainstream scholarship on all the wars Israel has fought. 
And it's a very impressive, I think, scholarly achievement. But for our purposes, what's more interesting is what he concludes. So let me quote him. Israel's war experience is a story of folly, recklessness, and self-made traps. None of the wars, with a possible exception of the 1948 War of Independence, none of the wars Israel fought were what Israelis referred to as a war of necessity. They were all wars of choice or folly. That's the current scholarly consensus. Israel's fabled purity of arms and liberal occupation have not fared much better after coming under the scrutiny of historians and human rights organizations. Amnesty International reported that Israel systematically tortured Palestinian detainees, while Human Rights Watch reported that Israel tortured thousands if not tens of thousands of Palestinian detainees. The Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem observed, and now I'm quoting it, Israel was the only country in the world where torture was legally sanctioned. This policy of routine torture was only modified by Israel's high court in 1999 after a worldwide outcry. The conflict between the liberalism of American Jews and the egregious illiberalism of Israel is the dynamic factor in the current relationship between them. Still, the dual loyalty factor occasionally makes itself felt. Although Israel pushed hard for the US to attack Iraq in 2003, American Jews significantly opposed it and opposed it in even greater per percentages in retrospect as the US invasion turned into a debacle. In part, the opposition sprang from the fact that liberals generally opposed the war, but it also sprang from the fear of American Jews that they would be scapegoated because of Israel's warmongering and the prominent role Jewish neoconservatives played in beating the drums of war. The same mix of factors, liberal ideology, and fear of the dual loyalty charge almost certainly account for the reticence of American Jews to support Prime Minister Netanyahu's latest round of warmongering. Although Netanyahu alleges that Jews will face a second Holocaust if and when Iran acquires nuclear weapons, that President Obama is a Chamberlain-like appeaser and by implication that a Romney victory would be good for the Jews. The latest American Jewish Committee poll shows that Jews will still, notwithstanding what Mr. Netanyahu says, will still overwhelmingly vote for Obama. They will still overwhelmingly approve, of, they still overwhelmingly approve of how Obama's handling national security they still strongly approve of how Obama's handling U.S.-Israeli relations, and they still strongly approve of how Obama's handling Iran's nuclear program. Revealingly, although 90% of those Jews polled said that they were worried about Iran obtaining nuclear weapons, they have still cautiously positioned themselves in the mainstream of American opinion on how to respond to the purported threat. It's also telling in recent weeks that when Jews occupying leadership positions in the Democratic Party must choose between winning the spoils of a presidential election and standing behind Zion as a second Holocaust allegedly looms large, as Mr. Netanyahu puts it, Iran is 20 yards from the goal line. These Jewish power holders put their material interest here 
before their distant kin there. To justify his, so to speak, abandonment of the Jews at the altar of power and privilege, Zion's faithful, like our own Senator Schumer, weirdly contrive that Obama is, and now I'm quoting Mr. Schumer, Senator Schumer, far more likely than Romney to launch a military attack on Iran. It appears that Netanyahu fell victim to his own Zionist propaganda, alas, internalized by many anti-Zionists as well, that Jews not only control the United States, but also, if called upon, will automatic, automatically act at Israel's behest. But you did not come here this afternoon for a sociological survey of the American-Jewish relationship with Israel. Most of you presumably want to know about the political implications of the end of the American-Jewish romance with Israel, in particular as it bears on Israel's occupation of Palestinian lands. I would suggest two complementary conclusions. A broad consensus now exists for resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict. It includes nearly the whole of the United Nations, the most respected legal bodies in the world, such as the International Court of Justice, and the most respected human rights organizations, such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch. This consensus calls for a two-state settlement on the June 1967 border, that is, a full Israeli withdrawal from the whole of the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, with minor and mutual land swaps, and a just solution of the refugee question based on the right of return and compensation. The consensus is grounded in basic and uncontroversial principles of international law and human rights. The framework of international law and human rights also forms the bedrock of American liberalism, to which Jews have disproportionately contributed. It is consequently within reach, it's now within reach, to win over American Jews on this political solution, or at least to shame them into supporting such a solution. But, it is inconceivable that American Jews can be won over to any solution that entails the coercive dissolution of Israel as a state. The current consensus for resolving the conflict based on liberal principles of law and human rights explicitly includes recognition of Israel as a state, although it does not require recognition of Israel as a discriminatory Jewish state. The concluding sentence of the 2004 International Court of Justice advisory opinion, it calls for, and now I'm quoting it, achieving as soon as possible on the basis of international law, the establishment of a Palestinian state existing side by side with Israel. I should add for clarification's sake, and so I won't be misunderstood, the International Court of Justice was very clear. They left no room whatsoever for ambiguity. The whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, and the whole of East Jerusalem are, to quote the International Court of Justice, occupied Palestinian territory, full stop. And the ICJ was equally clear that each and every one of those Israeli settlements is illegal, a flagrant violation of international law. So, when the ICJ concludes as it does, and as I've just quoted it, calling for the establishment of a Palestinian state existing side by side with Israel, there is no wiggle room whatsoever, there is no controversy whatsoever about what they have in mind. The Israelis have to pack up their bags and leave all the territory they conquered in June 1967. This framework, namely the one enunciated by the International Court of Justice, the UN human rights organizations, this framework is the furthermost limit to which Jewish liberal opinion can be carried 
because it is the limit of the global liberal consensus. The end of the American Jewish romance with Israel will be a boon not only for the Palestinians but for the Israelis as well. Since the June 1967 war, Israel has been a stage on which American Jews have played out their fantasies of toughness, often from Martha's Vineyard, and a pawn in their pursuit of power and privilege. If Israel has become a crazy state, and it has, it is in no small part because of American Jews. By abetting its most retrograde tendencies and freeing it of needful restraints, they have exerted a baleful influence on Israeli society. But American Jews now have an opportunity to right a double wrong, the horror inflicted on Palestine and the damage caused to Israel. If the liberal conscience of American Jews is pricked and finally they do the right thing, the long dark night might yet soon end. Thank you. Thank you so much to Or Books, uh, Vera List Center, Adam, and the others who organized this event. It's uh, an honor to be here. Uh, I'm excited to be here and by the topic of this event because I believe we are at a crossroads, not only in terms of Jewish American feelings towards Israel, as Dr. Finkelstein meticulously documents in his book, but also the place of Jewish voices in the movement. There is no question that there is a monumental shift happening among American Jews with increasing numbers coming out against Israel's occupation and apartheid policies against the Palestinian people. This is largely a generational shift driven by young people who have become allies to the cause even as their parents repeat the same tired arguments that they did decades ago about Israel's moral superiority and lack of a partner for peace. People like Dr. Finkelstein and Dr. Chomsky, who I'm also sorry couldn't be here, and many others deserve credit for, the deca for decades of speaking out against Israel's abuses of Palestinians when so few Jewish or other Americans did. Palestinians, of course, have always been speaking out as long as they have been oppressed, though nobody listened. The courage of all these voices in the dark paved the way for many of us today. Today, many synagogues can no longer even talk about this issue because it is so divisive. The traditional gatekeepers of the conversation are in crisis. For example, the Jewish Community Relations Council, the JCRC, in the San Francisco Bay Area where I was living the past year, is suffering a very clear downward trajectory. More than 90% of its donors are over 40 years old. The organization says it represents the Jewish community, but it won't publish the list of synagogues because, in fact, the number is very few. Meanwhile, organizations like Jewish Voice for Peace are growing in leaps and bounds. Its mailing list now boasts 125 subscribers. There are also explicitly anti-Zionist organizations like the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network. Young, Jewish, and Proud, the youth wing of Jewish Voice for Peace is growing particularly quickly with more and more young Jews, young American Jews reclaiming American Jewish identity as rooted in support for equality and justice rather than unconditional support for a state across the world that does not represent them. Along with the growth of Jewish support for Palestinian rights, however, comes a dangerous phenomenon. That is, Jewish voices eclipsing Palestinian voices. Palestinian voices have long been dismissed as angry, irrational, biased. Even people supporting justice for Palestinians often say they'd rather have a Jewish speaker come to their community because our voices are more credible. They would rather have me telling Palestinian stories than a Palestinian, the expert, telling her or his own stories. 
Even like today, events like today's draw larger crowds than, than a panel of Palestinians speaking out about their own struggle. Intentional or not, what happens is that just as we are trying to break down the imbalance of power and privilege in Israel-Palestine, we are recreating the same power imbalance in the U.S. context. We must challenge not only Israel's abuse of Palestinians, but the underlying racism at its core that somehow Jews are more important than Palestinians. We must acknowledge that privileging Jewish American voices rather than featuring and listening to Palestinian voices is rooted in racism. Let's take an analogy. Imagine an all-male speaking tour in the late 1960s promoting the feminist movement. Imagine people inviting panels of men to speak about feminism because, well, women are so angry and irrational. They won't be heard as credible. Any half-politicized person would rightly have called this out for what it is, misogynistic. Because the feminine movement was not and is not just about an end goal of getting women certain rights. It's about empowering women, women being able to speak for ourselves. It's about transforming society overall. Speaking for myself, the same goes for this movement. As we speak about freedom and justice for Palestinians, their voices must be at the center. And I'll talk about what that means in practice a little later. But meanwhile, what is the, the role of Jewish Americans on this issue? I would argue that an honest analysis of the situation shows that mainstream Jewish American institutions are among the traditional gatekeepers on this issue, and that Jewish voices are uniquely placed to challenge and disrupt those institutions' hegemony. We must be present in coalitions challenging those institutions, defending allies from claims and charges of anti-Semitism that are used to stifle legitimate discussion about Israel and to suppress action. The more of us that speak out, the harder it becomes for pro-occupation Jewish institutions to claim to be in any way representative. By showing that the Jewish community is not monolithic, we show that this is not an identity-based struggle between Jews and Palestinians, but a struggle for human rights like any other. To put it another way, it's not about Jews leading the way, it's about stepping out of the way. I'll give you an example. This past summer in the Bay Area, I was part of a hearing by the Sonoma County Commission on Human Rights regarding an upcoming local bus contract renewal with Veolia, which is a company that is also deeply implicated in the Israeli occupation. It was standing room only with testifiers flowing out the door waiting to speak. Defending the local bus contract were representatives of Veolia Corporation and some members of the Jewish community. On the other side was a diverse group of community members and others from the Jewish community. In other words, it was only the Jewish community that was divided. What was the effect? Our voices countering those from the JCRC helped the commissioners and all the media and witnesses there to see plainly the situation for what it really was, a struggle of people versus power and corporate impunity. We made space for others to be heard, and as Jews, we can use our voices particularly to help lift up the voices of Palestinians that have been silenced for so long. By the way, and I'm speaking for myself here, this does not mean that we give people permission to listen to Palestinian voices. Historically, the role of Jewish American allies has been to show that it's okay to criticize Israel, to support boycott and divestment, etc. But what's really needed is a complete paradigm shift. If it's the, it's the concept that you, whoever you are, do not need permission from Jews or anybody else to do what you believe is the right thing to do. It's not that we don't participate. We should, of course, we must enthusiastically. But we must also make sure that Jewish American voices are not, as they have been in the past, regulating the terms of the discussion, including when it comes to the vision of the future of Israel-Palestine and the means of the freedom struggle of Palestinians. Our particular mandate to challenge US institutional support for Israel, most notably the roughly $3, million, $3 billion in military aid awarded Israel with our tax dollars every year, is clear and always has been. 
Meanwhile, we must carry an extra sense of humility when it comes to an indigenous movement, particularly when, it, when we come from the oppressing group, in this case, both as Jews and as Americans. And that means listening when we are given the opportunity to support the oppressed. In 2005, Palestinian civil society issued a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, BDS, against Israel until it complies with international law and ends its, Isra ends its illegal occupation, implements full equality for Palestinians inside Israel, and promotes the right of return for Palestinian refugees. All of these three things are also inscribed in international law. The call does not specify what the solution should look like necessarily. Behind this call stands the largest breadth and broadest consensus of Palestinian voices to my knowledge. It has been signed by more than 170 organizations representing all segments of Palestinian civil society, including unions, all major political parties, human rights organizations, and, uh, and more. The growing global BDS movement is a thriving, diverse, and inclusive movement. It is strategic in nature, empowering groups around the world to choose targets and tactics that are appropriate within each particular context. It stands on three pillars, freedom, equality, and justice, representing the three rights articulated in the call, the three minimal components to fulfilling Palestinians' most fundamental rights. The movement has had tremendous success so far, with victories announced weekly or sometimes daily from around the world, growing in size and significance. Most recently in the US, for example, the Quaker Friends Fiduciary Corporation, which manages investments for more than 250 Quaker institutions around the country, decided to divest from Caterpillar, Veolia, and Hewlett Packard. <laughs> Following following concerns expressed by a Palestine-Israel action group and their local friends meeting. Earlier this year, Morgan Stanley Capital Investment, MSCI, delisted Caterpillar from its list of socially responsible investments, prompting financial giant TIAA Cref to divest close to 73 million from their social choice fund. These are just two of the most recent examples. But the greatest success of the BDS movement is its effect on the discourse. Here in the US, campaigns playing out in mainstream churches, shopping centers, university campuses, and city councils have fundamentally shifted the question about whether or not, uh, from whether or not Israel is committing crimes to what are we gonna do about it. The gatekeepers of the occupation are suddenly on the defensive where they have never been before. And more than any book or speaker, and I'm speaking as an author and a public speaker, ever could before, BDS campaigns, whether they win or lose, are changing the way that people think about Israel and the Palestinians. I believe the success of BDS is behind some of the exciting phenomena that Dr. Finkelstein writes about in his book. This shift in discourse will also be key to forcing an end to US military aid and other US institutional, including corporate, support that enables Israel's abuses. In part through BDS, the Palestine Solidarity Movement has transformed from talking about, from talking about Palestinian self-determination to manifesting it. Palestinians are no longer relegated to the sidelines of their own liberation struggle, but are in fact the leaders of it. This, of course, makes speakers like myself much less important, and that's okay with me. In fact, I'm happy about it. Freed from the old paradigm, the result is quite beautiful. Quote, it's clear what the future looks like, end quote. To quote Cecily Zaraski of Jewish Voice for Peace in her article written after the first night of the, U the University of California at Berkeley hearings on divestment. She noted, and I have seen as well, from Sonoma County to the United Methodist and Presbyterian Church's recent divestment hearings to the many others playing out on campuses from New York City to San Diego, that while on the one side you had a small group of isolated Jewish students and leaders holding each other fearfully, on the other side you saw a diverse group of Jews, Palestinians, Muslims, Israelis, Arabs, African Americans, Latina and Latino community members, queer allies, feminists, and others interconnected, holding hands in friendship, solidarity, and anticipation. And as a young Jewish American, 
This is what I want my community and my place in the movement to look like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna and Norman, for those wonderful talks. The questions that we've received fall essentially into three categories. First, uh, questions about the American Jewish community and its relationship to Israel. Questions having to do with uh, a political strategy, for example, boycott uh, and divestment sanctions. And thirdly, questions about what an ultimate settlement or solution uh, might look like. So my suggestion is that we start with, question, with uh, the questions on the American Jewish community's relationship uh, to the state of Israel. Uh, Norman argues very eloquently that there is a growing rift or a parting of ways. Uh, one question that has been raised by a number of, um, a number of you has been, uh, what kind of evidence is there of this uh, growing uh, rift? Are we seeing rather a, a reshuffling of the American Jewish uh, political spectrum where uh, you have a hard core of ultra supporters represented by the lobby and the likes of Sheldon Adelson, while most Jews simply ignore the conflict and then a small group of people uh, uh, representing a left, a, a radical left, are making alliances with Palestinians. Are we seeing a reshuffling or are we actually seeing a parting of ways? Uh, I'm going to, to uh, read a few questions having to do with the American Jewish community. Today the word Zionism is used to refer to uncritical supporters of Israel, Israeli policy. But as I've studied it, Zionism is an umbrella term for several movements pivoting around the Jewish national question and are also often opposing each other. Do you think it would be useful in the interests of engaging the Jewish community to revive the notion of cultural Zionism? I think this person is referring to the cultural Zionism of Ahad Ham and, and uh, Judah Magnus who, did not, who envisioned a Jewish homeland but not a Jewish state, um, as opposed to blanketly announcing Zionism as racism? That's one question. We'll, we'll take two more before we proceed. Since Jewish American youth identity still largely revolves around Israel, it would seem that transforming Jewish American politics requires that we articulate and institutionalize an, alter, an alternate non-Zionist Jewish identity. How would we do that? And what would the content of that identity look like? And then finally, is there anyone in Israel with whom we can partner to push for a political solution. So we'll begin with those three questions before proceeding to matters of strategy. Go ahead if you want. I'll, I'll address the first question, namely the usefulness, the utility of using the term Zionism in trying to reach a broad public. Let me just say as a premise I think that's what we're trying to do. We're supposed to be trying to reach a broad public and build a real movement. And so far as I could tell, there are real prospects now of reaching a broad public. So that's my premise. And it's on the basis of that premise, which it seems to me is the only logical premise if you're interested in politics. Uh, on the basis of that premise, then where does Zionism fit in? First of all, I have a personal stake in the notion of Zionism because I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the topic. So if I diminish its significance, it's at great personal sacrifice <laughs> since of my professional career, all that remains is that doctoral dissertation. Uh, personally, or I should say, let me amend that, politically, I don't see any utility whatsoever of talking about Zionism nowadays. First of all, 
most people haven't a clue what it means. Secondly, you know, for most people, Zionism is a hairspray. Nobody knows what Zionism is outside a small group of people for whom it's a, a matter of intense interest. Secondly, in my opinion, everything you want to say by denouncing Zionism, everything of any political utility that you want to say is denouncing Zionism, anything you want to say, you can use the language that people understand. You could say you're against settlements. You're against ethnic cleansing. You're against a discriminatory state. All those principles can be rendered in a language that's accessible, that's understandable, that's comprehensible to a broad public. Whereas when you start using terminology like Zionism, A, the broad public has never heard of it. B, the term is so filled with ambiguity that it doesn't communicate a clear message. Now, some people make the analogy with apartheid. They say, don't we want to turn Zionism into a dirty word, as it were, in the same way as the international community successfully, uh, or I should say the solidarity movement, successfully turned apartheid into a dirty word. The problem with the analogy is the following. In the case of apartheid, there was no misunderstanding about what the term meant. Apartheid meant separate development. Any member of the African, uh, excuse me, of the South African government would tell you that. Any member of the opposition would tell you that. They differed, they differed not on the meaning of the term, they differed on the justice of the term. The South African government and its apologists claimed that separate development was simply the self-determination of different tribes in South Africa. So you had a separate self-determination for Transkei, Siskei, Bofu, Botswana, uh, and the various Bantustans. They differed on the, the moral justice of apartheid. They did not differ on what it meant. The problem with Zionism is there's no consensus on what it means. Professor Chomsky likes to say, I was a Zionist from age five. Well, you know, at age five, I was trying to figure out how to tie my shoe and zipper my pants, and he had already read the whole corpus of Zionist literature, <laughs> uh, resolved that he's a Zionist. Does that make Professor Chomsky the enemy? Or does it mean that the notion of Zionism is so replete with different meanings that trying to communicate it as a political idea that we should oppose is a dead end? The problem I have with the Zionism is it's become one of those ideological litmus tests. And one era was, are you now or have you ever been a communist? Now it's, are you now or have you ever been a Zionist? I noticed a few weeks, or I should say a couple of months ago, Daniel Barenboim, uh, the BDS movement, was celebrating the fact that Daniel Barenboim's East-Western Diwan, created with Edward Said, that it had been denied entry into Qatar. And the reason that this was a great victory, they said, is because Barenboim is a Zionist. Baron Boehm is the enemy now also? Is that how you build a movement? Is that how you breach a broad public? By even writing off people like Professor Chomsky and Daniel Baron Boehm because they're quote unquote Zionists? That doesn't make sense to me. So, so um, I would agree with Dr. Finkelstein that we can uh, sort of convey all that we want to convey without using the word Zionism. Um, but I think that there's space. I think there's space for people who want to use the word Zionism. And I think it's important to be clear about what we mean when we say it, to define it precisely because people have different definitions for it. So we're clear about what we mean and we say it. I don't mean 
me necessarily, but people. Um, and then there's space for people who don't want to use it. Um, the, we do have a real movement. We already have a real movement. It's thriving. There are people who talk about Zionism, and the sky hasn't fallen. It continues to grow. Um, so I would say if, you know, within your context and according to your, you know, your moral criteria, um, you feel that it's important to talk about Zionism, you know, that's, that's great. And if you feel that it's not strategic, then, then don't. And there's space. This is a, a flexible and, and, and amazingly um, open movement in that way, I think. Um, I would say, actually, that, you know, I, I was very afraid in the first uh, year that I started speaking, um, I was afraid that if I were to sort of jump to the next level of, you know, being explicit, let's say, about the right of return, that I would be shunned, that the organizations that were okay with me talking about ending the occupation, the minute that I started talking about right of return and uh, equality for Palestinians within Israel, that I would no longer be welcome to speak. And in fact, that didn't happen once. I think the people who are opposed to, to what we're doing are going to be opposed to what we're doing, and the people who support it are, are going to support it. And the, using the word Zionism is not going to be the thing that makes the difference. Um, uh, let's see, someone asked about uh, cultural Zionism, uh, you know, a homeland versus a state. Um, I, I think the idea of a Jewish homeland is, is fine. I, my, my issue is with privileging Jewish rights um, over Palestinian rights. Um, and someone asked about... Um, I, think the, I think the question, just to jump in, sure. on this issue of cultural Zionism is, is there a place in a movement against the occupation for those who are seeking to rediscover a more critical version of Zionism, in this case, the, the Zionism of Ahad Ham, a Zionism which, which uh, as this questioner suggests, was not based on expansionism and, uh, or, even on an, an, or even on an exclusive ethnic Jewish state. Is there a place, because there's, a, there's something of a confusion. Are we talking about Zionism as a description of people in the movement or as an epithet used by people in the movement to describe their opponents? What exactly are we talking about when we're talking about Zionism? So, I mean, to the extent that I understand cultural Zionism Ed, as it was being used by the question asker, it's, it's about exclusivity. It's about what it means for the Palestinian people. So, um, you know, maybe Dr. Finkelstein can answer more fully, but, but I would say, um, yeah, yeah, if, if um, that there's space for people who want to re-explore their, their definition of Zionism, and what's important is um, that it's not on the backs of the Palestinian people. So that, that's where I, I stand on that. Um, about Baron, what about the... Um, the, the orchestra, I want to be very clear that the BDS guidelines um, are very clear that, uh, that institutions are boycotted uh, and not individuals. So the idea that something was boycotted because some individual that's part of it um, was a Zionist um, would not be according to the BDS guidelines. So either there's a misunderstanding about what the, what the, you know, what the orchestra was doing, or uh, this was a, a not following the BDS guidelines. Um, I, as far as I understand it, I think the criteria that was met was that it was um, a type of normalization. Um, and so that's, that's my understanding of it. Um, another question related oh. to these, um, how has the rhetoric this actually follows up from the question about Zionism. And I, I feel bad because someone asked also about Israeli partners, should I just say? Probably. I think we can probably okay. lead into that. Terrific. How has the rhetoric of J Street affected Jewish Americans uh, in the Israel-Palestine? Is, is J Street expanding the conversation, narrowing mm -hmm. it? Any thoughts on J Street? Do you want me to go first, do you? Mm -hmm. Um, so, first of all, in terms of the question about Israeli partners, um, the, there are many Israeli partners boycott from within, for example, uh, Israelis who support the Palestinian call for BDS are a great example of people who are playing a major role in, in that global, global movement. There are many others also. I have a list in my book and you can find them readily online. Um, in terms of J Street, so um, the issue with J Street, for those who may not be um, aware of its sort of full platform is my understanding is that it's really not about human rights or about Palestinians either. The idea is that we have to end the occupation because it's bad for the Jewish people. And referring back to the concepts that I talked about in my talk, this in fact reinforces the underlying racism that what's important is what's good for Jews and not what's right 
what's, what respects human rights. And so if, if we follow that logic, we in, in fact perpetuate um, the very structures that we want to be breaking down. Um, I actually think though that J Street has been, I hope I don't get in trouble for using this word, but a kind of gateway drug, that there are people who are more inclined to, to join J Street than they would something that goes further, and, and that eventually they do go further. So there's that to acknowledge, but um, I, would, I would never align myself with an organization um, that, that reinforces what I think is racism. I'll just, uh, I want to respond briefly to some of the things Anna said and then move on to the question of J Street. Uh, when I was a college, when I was college age and a little bit thereafter, in a previous political incarnation, I was a Maoist. Uh, Mao Zedong, live like him, dare to struggle, dare to win. That was our inspiration and our cause. And much of Maoism, of course, has uh, not weathered well by history. <laughs> I'm not quite as prepared as those who are laughing to say it was all wrong. Uh, but one of the things I remember from the days of Chairman Mao was one of his slogans, namely, uh, unite the many to defeat the few. How do you unite the many and how do you isolate the uh, adversary who's creating an obstacle. And that's my approach to politics now over many years. Namely, you speak a lot, Anna speaks a lot, I speak a lot, and you watch what works with an audience, what isolates the diehards, what wins over large numbers of people. It's not a popularity contest. Obviously, you want to maintain principles. But on the other hand, your goal is to unite the many, to defeat the few. Now, when you start talking about something like Zionism, the other side loves it. You're playing right into their hands because they start with, well, Zionism is a national liberation of movement of the Jews. Okay, that's step one. Then the Jews are a people, they are a nation. And then you start arguing, are Jews a people, a race, a religion, a nation? And then before you know it, it becomes this kind of uh, eternal navel gazing, where you're talking about Zionism, Jews, the history of the Jewish people, are they a religion, are they a nation, what are they? Oh, they're such an enigma, it's so complicated. And before you know it, we forgot about the occupation. <laughs> and the role of politics is to keep that focus so they can't get out of it. They want to talk about, are Jews a nation, a people, a race, or whatever? Usually they say they're all three. Um, and you say, no, we're not talking about Zionism here. And we're not talking, excuse me, we're not going to be talking about Jews now. We're talking about the occupation. We're talking about the law. We're talking about Israel's egregious violations of basic principles of international law. That's what we want to talk about. So I get a little bit queasy when I hear Anna say there's space for this and space for that. With all due respect to somebody I deeply admire, that reminds me of the 60s. It's a little bit too feely touchy for my taste. <laughs> Now, I'll admit, the hardline Maoism, that doesn't have a place any longer either. But we have to maintain the focus. We have to have a clear agenda for people. Otherwise, we lose the public. The moment you start talking about Zionism, Jews, right, the public, you know, all right. And they tune you out. They close their eyes, they fade out, you lose them. I'm watching the audience, and the moment they, I hear, I watch. That's the most important thing about speaking and teaching. You have to always watch the audience. Unfortunately, people like Fidel never grasped that idea, <laughs> and he didn't care if there was nobody left in the room, and the few who are left are sprawled on the floor, sound asleep. 
He just kept talking. Well, that's, of course, the prerogatives of being a dictator, a, charism a charismatic one, but still a dictator. Uh, but we have to watch the audience. And with all due modesty, I have, good, I have pretty sensitive antenna from many years of teaching. The moment we start talking about cultural Zionism, already half the audience is half asleep. Because they don't know what Zionism is to begin with, and now cultural Zionism, where the hell are we going? <laughs> you know? <clears throat> we have to be careful about that. This is not a debating society. It's politics, it's real people's suffering. And that's the prize we have to always keep our eyes on. And that's why, unlike, uh, unlike Anna, I, I'm not so tolerant of there's space for everything and everyone. No, there's no space, with all due respect, they're very nice people, there's no space for Hare Krishnas. Uh, and uh, <laughs> there's no space, yes, if we're serious. Now, the, the, the last thing about the J Street. Um, J Street, uh, its leadership is absolutely horrible. Uh, no, they are. They're, they're ghastly. The, their, idea, their idea of open-minded politics is Zippy Livni, that's, uh, you know, uh, who brought to you the Gaza massacre uh, and was very proud of it, incidentally. She boasted about how we, to quote her, how we carried on with real hooliganism in Gaza. And that's their idea of uh, an enlightened policy to support. But one has to make a very big distinction between the J Street leadership and the J Street base. The base is many people join J Street because they figure it's the only game in town. There's either APAC or J Street. And they join J Street because they want to be part of something progressive. Uh, and they don't see any alternative. And I think our challenge now is we have to create a third alternative. Uh, one that's seriously grounded in international law, human rights, uh, and to give people a third alternative. If we give people that third alternative, my opinion is we could probably win over about three quarters of the J Street base uh, because there's just a lot of people there who are you know, itching for something more than the, uh, what J Street has to offer, which is really not very much. So. To be very clear, I was not talking about space for everybody. There's no space for racists. There's no space for bigots. What I meant was that there is, I believe that there is space for using different kinds of language. As somebody who has also spoken a lot and who has a lot of experience with um, being compelling, I like to believe, uh, to diverse audiences, um, I fail to understand how we can simultaneously be talking about keeping the focus on Palestinians and their experience, and I like to think their voices, but saying you can't use this or that word. Palestinians use the word Zionism. So to say we want to honor and keep our focus on Palestinians, but don't you dare use that word, seems to me hypocritical and, um, and wrong. Um, uh, so, and it, because it's not really just about what we say as speakers, it's about what Palestinians um, are, you know, we're not the only speakers out there. Um, I, I totally uh, agree that we need to, to, to reach out to diverse audiences, to, to bring people along in some cases to meet them where the, they're, they're at, to, 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 you know, invite them on that journey. Um, but, but where is our breaking point? And that is... And, and I believe our breaking point is when we begin to um, when we begin to lose sight of the fundamental basic rights of Palestinians. So, um, <laughs> thanks, Anna. So, as you can see, not only are Jews not united on Israel, they're not united in the way they oppose Israel. <laughs> um, I want to follow up on on, a, on Norman's point about the question of audience. Uh, Norman is arguing that talk of Zionism risks alienating the audience, boring the audience, offending the audience, some members of the audience, and that it's just not very practical to engage in discussions of Zionism in our opposition to uh, Israeli conduct. Zionism is a charged word. Uh, so is uh, the uh, BDS, um, and I think that our sp this question has been raised by a number of people. What is your position on boycott, divestment, and sanctions? 
Uh, would you both care to comment on that? I support it fully. <laughs> I, I won't uh, say whether I support fully or partially uh, for a very simple reason, because there are many versions of BDS out there, and to speak of it as if it's a unified, single, homogeneous whole, I think is disingenuous, which is just a fancy word for dishonest. So what is BDS? Let's take a practical examples. Well, first of all, uh, let me just go through what BDS says it is. And then we'll look at what BDS is in practice. So if you read any of the statements on BDS, and I've read them all, and I've read the only, there are a couple of books on the topic, both of which I've read, a few books on the topic, maybe three, uh, which I've read. The first thing that BDS always says is we are, anchored in international law. That's their premise. BDS is about international law, which to me is terrific. That's my point of view also. The only way to win the conflict is to anchor it in the principle which a broad public is willing to support. So, but then as Anna correctly said in her remarks, uh, BDS takes no position on Israel, what she called the solution. She takes no position on Israel. But that seems to me to be, at, at minimum, that seems to me to be a contradiction. Because international law is very clear on the subject. There is no ambiguity whatsoever when it comes to international law on resolving the Israel-Palestine conflict, what Anna referred to as the solution. It's very clear. That's why I was very cautious in my introductory remarks I was going to quote what the International Court of Justice said on the topic. The International Court of Justice, the highest judicial body in the world, basically the arbiter of what international law constitutes in the current world, the International Court of Justice says, all of the territory to the east of the Green Line is occupied Palestinian territory, namely the whole of the West Bank, the whole of Gaza, and East Jerusalem. But the part to the west of the Green Line, that is Israel. That is a state under international law. And it says at the end, the last sentence of its opinion, it says, we look forward to the creation of a Palestinian state side by side with Israel living in peace with its neighbors. So to me, it's perplexing how you can both claim that your whole enterprise is based in international law, yet claim to be agnostic of one critical component of that international law. Now, you may not like the international law, and that's fair enough. But if you don't like the law, don't pretend, don't claim that your enterprise is based in international law because it is not. The law is not agnostic or silent on the question of Israel. The law is very clear on that question. Number two, can you reach, and I'm repeating myself again because it's my only criterion and my only concern, can you reach a broad public without taking a position on Israel? or as Anna says, to say you have no solution. So what happens in the real world? Now, in the real world, based on my experience over 30 years, the real world, this is what happens. There's a broad public. It listens to your side. You say the occupation is terrible, Palestinians are being oppressed, massive human rights violations, and the broad public nods its head. Yes, that's terrible. And then you say that we know we have to um, support BDS. Okay, but remember, we don't live in a totalitarian country. We live, relatively speaking, 
in a democracy, relatively speaking, which means the people who just heard you, they have two ears, not one. And now they go listen to the other side. And the other side is very well organized. The other side is very energetic and aggressive. And they say, don't believe a word those BDS people are telling you. They say they care about the occupation. They say they care about the oppression of Palestinians, but it's not true. What they really want to do is they want to destroy the state of Israel. That's their real agenda. Okay, the public has now heard the other side. It then goes back and it says, well, we found what you said very convincing, but now we hear that your real goal is you want to destroy the state of Israel. So what do you say to that? Well, we take no position on Israel. Is that convincing? Will that win a broad public? Or will the broad public think, hey, you know what? Those other people, they had a point, maybe. It's a question of how you reach a public. And you can't reach a public, number one, if you claim to be basing yourselves on international law, when in fact you're not. That's just not honest. And number two, you can't reach a broad public if you claim to be agnostic on the question of Israel, because agnosticism covers a very broad spectrum. Yes, it could be relatively nice things, like we want to create a multinational Jewish state, and that, but it can also include we want to destroy Israel. Agnosticism has a lot of things that can fit into that we take no solution. And if a broad public wants to read the most nefarious possibility in that, I think it's actually within their right. Now, one last thing. Anna, in her presentation, she lists all these victories of BDS. But are they victories for BDS? I was involved in BDS before there was BDS. No, I was. I would go to the Presbyterian conventions each year, give out hundreds of copies of my book to try to convince them to vote for divestment from Israel. But if you read, for example, I'll just give as an illustration. You, you read, for example, Omar Barghouti's book, BDS. He says, if you support Israel, you're not really BDS. If you support the existence of the state of Israel, you're not really BDS. There's a real BDS. Now, of all the examples you gave, of all the examples you gave, how many of those organizations which divested how many of them take no position on Israel? My understanding is none. So by the criteria of the BDS movement, that's not BDS. It's just supporting with a lower case boycott, divestment, sanctions, which of course I support. But if BDS means being neutral on the existence of Israel, well, then none of the organizations or none of the victories you cited are actually victories for BDS because the, the church organizations are very clear. We're not talking about the dissolution of the state of Israel. There's no ambiguity in the Presbyterian position on that. I've read their platform. So it's a kind of dishonest conflation to call these victories as victories for BDS when they are nothing of the sort. They are victories for boycott, divestment, and sanctions until and unless Israel ends its occupation and there's a just solution of the refugee question. That's what the real BDS in the real world, where there have been victories, that's what those victories are about. And of course, I completely support them. So that's a lot. 
So I'll, let's see what I can do here. Um, so first of all, there is one call. There are not many different BDS movements. There is one BDS call. There are people who do boycott, divestment, and sanctions in you know, various forms. But when we're talking about the BDS movement, the brand, so to speak, there is one call. You can find it at bdsmovement.net uh, and maybe answer a lot of questions you might have about it. Um, so if I understand, logically speaking, the, the sort of... Um, the train of thought, um, is that if BDS advocates for the right of return, equal rights for Palestinians inside Israel, and an end to the occupation, that equals a one state, and that is bad. I think that's what I understood uh, from Dr. Finkelstein. No, First of I all, never mentioned one no. state. Okay, well, let, let, what let, I... We're, we're going to hold off on the one state okay. discussion. Just, I just don't want you to... Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so what, what, I, what I did understand, though, is this idea that international consensus is around a two-state solution. I, that was mentioned. Um, and therefore, anything that could possibly inter be interpreted as anything else is bad. Um, and, and I, first of all, would maintain that the BDS movement does not take a position on this, and be, precisely because different, uh, different organizations inside the BDS um, uh, coalition have different perspectives on this, and that's okay. One state, two state, any states that respect the fundamental rights of Palestinians um, is is open for you know open for discussion. And to say that's not okay, I'm, I want to know which of those rights we're conceding on behalf of Palestinians, which by the way is not our right or prerogative. Um, if you're talking about international law, international law protects all three of these rights. We can't cherry pick. International law, yes, uh, it, it calls for the end of the occupation. It also calls for the right of return. It also calls for um, an end to discrimination of Palestinians inside what became Israel. For example, the one, Resolution 181, the partition plan, um, uh, was, was based on uh, absolutely no discrimination of, of, uh, of people up according to their ethnic or religious identity. Um, Israel's entry to the United Nations was conditional upon this, etc. So we can't say, um, we, we can't pick and choose which international law we're going to, um, we're going to uh, subscribe to. And I would say that dismissing um, aspects of international law is, in fact, uh, straying from the, the international consensus. Um, hold on. Um, the, the other thing I want to say about international consensus is since when is the consensus among powers what determines what we advocate for? If the international consensus was that the occupation is right and should continue, would we advocate for that? Of course not. What we advocate for is according to what is right. That's always what social justice movements have done. That's always where it started from. It starts small and it keeps getting bigger and that's exactly what's happening. The focus on the rights has been the strength, I believe, of the BDS movement and why we see it growing so quickly. Why we see it having more success, I believe, in educating the public, in bringing more people in than my tours, my you know, hundreds of different presentations ever did. It is exactly what brings people in instead of choosing one solution over another. So I don't think it's at all alienating. On the contrary, um, it's, it's working. It's pushing the envelope. Uh, I would also say that, that it is, you know, these social movements that change, uh, that change the international consensus. International consensus is not like a, a ready-made, you know, box that we have to, <laughs> that, that, that has always been there. It's something that changes over time, and that's, that's what we're, we're part of doing. Uh, and the last thing I would say in terms of the, the victories being exaggerated, first of all, is, as I said in my opening comments, um, BDS is a lot about education. And like I said, I believe that we have achieved a lot with BDS in, in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, galvanizing people, et cetera. To say that it hasn't actually worked, I mean, look at Israeli newspapers. You know, this, this movement is, is perceived as more um, challenging to the status quo than any, you know, diplomatic lip service by Obama or UN resolutions or any of those things ever did. Um, you know, we see it now mentioned regularly in the New York Times. Um, the Rayut Institute a think tank in Israel uh, has tried to rebrand Israel's image or develop this scheme to rebrand Israel's image because it's deteriorate, deteriorating so, so quickly. And for example, in Sonoma, County at the Veolia hearings, why did the Deputy Consul General of Israel in San Francisco stay throughout the night? Because we have no power? 
because we're so small and have no victories? No, precisely because we're challenging the status quo. And that's how change happens. We're going to turn now to the question of the solution. Uh, <laughs> Which we haven't talked about yet, of course. Uh, the international consensus for many, be for many years has been that a two-state settlement could resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, since the mid-1970s, the Palestinian national movement has essentially supported a two-state solution. That decision was formalized in 1988 in Algiers. Uh, but in recent years, many, well, this is a, 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 many informed students of the conflict have been stating their belief that the two-state solution is dead, or pretty much so. I'm quoting from one of the questions, uh, particularly the West Bank. Uh, is it realistic anymore to call for uh, a two-state solution given the expansion of settlements, the establishment of a kind of what Jeff Halper has called a, a matrix of control. Uh, are we calling for something that's no longer feasible? What do you prefer? I'm Shall we all do that? First. Okay. <laughs> um, so, in terms of is it realistic, and then you know what do we advocate for? Um, so, in terms of uh, hold on. Uh, in terms of what's realistic, so um, the professor Ilan Pape, who's actually speaking um, this uh, weekend at the Russell Tribunal on Palestine, which by the way, I think it's sold out, but in case you're able to go to it, it's just phenomenal. Um, he talks, he says the following, it's already one state. You have Jews living in the Palestinian West Bank. You have Palestinians living in, you know, the, the Jewish state. Uh, they're all living under the control of one government, one military. What would, what would happen? scary as it sounds, if you simply removed the institutions of apartheid and oppression and discrimination, and shocking as it sounds, gave equal rights to everybody, no matter what their religion or their ethnicity. I, I fail to understand why people hearing this think that it is a message of destruction. Was ending apartheid in South Africa destroying South Africa? No, it was liberating it from, from a discriminatory system that was, was its own Achilles heel. So I, I cannot help but defend against this sort of boogeyman and spearmongering around the idea of, um, of full implementation of these three rights as some sort of a destructive um, argument. Um, in terms of what do we advocate for, I don't think it's my role to be advocating either way. I, I don't have the same stake in the conflict as, or in the, the solution, um, not conflict, as, um, as Israelis and Palestinians. But I would say that whatever we're advocating for, let's define it. And if we're defining two states as one state that is, that is reserved uh, for one particular ethnic population and whose demographic balance can only be maintained through systematically, eternally denying the fundamental human rights of an entire population, then that is something <laughs> that we should look at and we should have a problem with. If you define two states in some other way, then, then it's a different discussion. One of the problems with this whole discussion of the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it's become so absurdly personalized and so divorced from politics. So whenever you get into a room with a couple of people and you start talking Israel-Palestine, inside of about a half minute, the first question that comes up, do you support one state or two states? As if politics were about what you support or what I support. That's not politics. Politics is about what you can reach a broad public on, what the broad public thinks is legitimate, reasonable, just, or what the broad public thinks is incipiently reasonable, legitimate, and just. That is, they're just at the point of reaching if we just can push them a little further. 
But politics is not about what I like or what you like. That's not politics. That's your personal ideology, which is something very different than politics. The second problem with this Israel-Palestine conflict, as I see it, especially as it's unfolded in the Palestine movement, is this notion that if you can prove something is logically sensible, therefore it's politically sensible. So, it's a kind of version of John Lennon's Imagine. Now, I think it's a beautiful song, but does it have much to do with politics? I don't think so. Let's take a logical example. So, the United States, there live now about 30 million people who claim to be, who are of uh, Mexican origin. About 30 million, about one-tenth of the American population. And as we all know, the United States stole half of Mexico. That's just a fact. And the Mexican economy is highly dependent on remittances from Mexican workers in the United States. So logically speaking, if we want to speak about logic, the obvious solution to the problem, as it's called, of illegal Mexican immigration, the logical solution is erase the border and create one state. Now, there are people in this room who applaud that. And, and, and to be honest, I've developed a real affinity for burritos so, I'm not particularly appalled at the idea. And Spanish people, at least from Latin America, tend to be very generous with North Americans. If you speak a couple of words of terrible Spanish and English, they're very nice about it. Don't ask about the Parisians uh, when you try to speak French. So, on all those counts, I'm not opposed to the idea of eliminating the border. But, if you're a political activist, if you're trying to reach a broad public on the question of Mexican immigration, is there even a snowball's chance in hell advocating one state is going to reach the public? Even though it's completely logical, it is. It's completely sensible, it is. It's also politically a dead end. People who are really interested in the topic, not uh, posturing, not posing, they talk about things like immigration reform. Yes, it sounds very boring. We want revolution, we don't want reform. Yeah. But that's politics. That's where we're at now in the United States. That's the limit. And now we have to ask ourselves again with the question of Israel-Palestine. What is, if I can use a phrase, the political horizon, the political horizon of enlightened public opinion? What's the limit that you can bring public opinion to at this particular point? Now, my, my understanding is the limit we can reach now, the limit, is what you would call the language of international law and human rights. Once you go past that limit, you lose the public. There was a time in the 1960s, 70s, you can use the language of Marxian socialism, and you could reach a public. I, in my mind, I vastly exaggerated how much of the public was just incipiently ready for the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, but that was, there was a sort of, you can use the fancy term, a counter discourse. It doesn't exist anymore. In the world in which we live, the limit is international law, human rights. That's what people are ready to understand. Now, Anna says, oh, why are we going to defer to what the international powers say? But it's not just the international powers. That's why I said it's also the International Court of Justice. It's also the human rights organizations. It's Amnesty, it's Human Rights Watch. They're all part of that consensus. They all start from one basic fact. They start from the fact that the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem are occupied Palestinian territories. 
They do not start from the fact that Israel is occupied Palestinian territory. Their point of departure is the law. So when you want to dismiss that law, you are dismissing, as far as I could tell, the limit of enlightened public opinion in the world today. That to me means we're no longer talking to ourselves. I should, I take that back. We are only talking to ourselves. <laughs> Number two, you still haven't answered the conundrum that the law says Israel is a state. Now, how can you say you support the law and not recognize what the law in every context I've mentioned recognizes, that Israel is a state? As to the solution, as far as I can tell, the limit we can reach is the law. I think we can win a broad public to it. I think if we do things right, we can win a large chunk of the Jewish community. I thought Alan, uh, Adam's formulation at the beginning was right. Uh, maybe I exaggerate a little, and he said, maybe we're talking about the diversification of the American Jewish community, which was once a uh, ironclad block. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, we can reach a large part of the public. Now, there's one last question which Adam was uh, uh, hinting at, or more than hinting at, the question of practicality. Are two states still possible? This is not a rhetorical question, it's a practical one. And if you look at the various maps that the Palestinians have presented in the course of negotiations, they have, for example, presented a map that shows Israel would keep approximately 1.9% of the West Bank, on which, in that 1.9%, about 302,000 of the settlers live, about 62% of the settlers, in exchange for a land swap from Israel of 1.9%. So it's a mutual land swap, which will enable about 60% of the settlers to remain in place. I understand that Americans who have been involved in this, as well as Israelis, not Israelis, international people, uh, they're coming up with their own maps. I'm not an expert in geography. I don't pretend to be. I think a lot of people who say the two-state settlement is dead make pretensions about their knowledge that don't correspond to their actual uh, understanding. But there are maps that have been pre presented. Let me stress. They are put together by the best Palestinian geographers, in particular a person named Dr. Sami El Abed. They are very, very detailed maps. He goes through every dunam of land to show how two states would work. What's most striking is when he presented his maps to the Israelis during negotiations, in particular to Tsipi Livni, who was the foreign minister, was handling this issue. Zippy Livni, she looked at the maps, and you could tell she found the maps convincing on their terms. And she didn't have an easy answer. So she started to ask the Palestinian, in particular, Dr. Samuel Abbott, what about this village? He says, we know about that village, but we can build a bridge there. What about that town? He says, we know about that town, but you can build a road here. And you see that Zippy Livni realizes, you know what? It's actually a fair solution. She doesn't say it. What she says is, and it's absolutely critical, she says, and now I'm paraphrasing, I can't remember verbatim the quote, she says, no Israeli prime minister accepting such a map could survive politically. The problem is not physical. The problem is political that you have to change the calculus of costs for Israel such that they're willing to accept the map. Right now, Israel has the first, probably in history, cost-free occupation. As uh, Sarah Roy put it in her new book on Hamas, she said they have zero responsibility and total control. Policing is done by the Palestinians. Paying the bills is paid for by the Europeans, 
and the political work is done by the United States. So why should Israel agree to any map? It's cost free. Our job is to change the calculus of costs such that Israel realizes the price of keeping the occupation is more expensive than withdrawing from Palestinian territory. So I want to clarify again that we are talking about international law. We are talking about rights inscribed in international law. And, and so we're not talking about a departure from that. We're also talking about something that is working in terms of bringing in pub the public. It's something that, again, I mean, I'm repeating myself, but, but I'm not the only one. This is something that is working, that is appealing to a wide audience. Um, so I, I believe that to say, you know what, Palestinians, I like your idea of rights, but it's not practical. It's just not realistic. That's privilege. Palestinians don't have the ability to say, to detach, to say, you know what? We, they, they need to fight for their rights, just like every single person in this room would do in their position. So for us to stand here, to sit here in New York City and say, you know what, it's not practical for Palestinians to have all of their rights is wrong. It's unacceptable. And, and to say that people who advocate for all of these rights don't have a stake or somehow don't care enough, these are Palestinians advocating for these rights. The largest breadth and spectrum that we've found of Palestinians through, through the call, and I refer to the call not as a dogma, but an actual document that we see all of the Pal these Palestinian groups are asking for, to say that, 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 that they don't have a stake in it, that they don't care, and that's why they're at, like, uh, of course they care. <laughs> it's, it's, it's blatantly obvious, and if, um, if, if, if people hadn't spoken out for what was right at a time when it wasn't correct, or when they were a small group, which I don't think we are anymore, I think we have a critical mass if we actually get to it and start BDS campaigns and advocacy, I think we're there. But if people had said it's unrealistic, we wouldn't have seen the end of apartheid in South Africa. We wouldn't have seen the end uh, of, of Jim Crow. And those are things we're proud of. We're proud of the people who spoke up um, and didn't compromise and didn't say to slaves, well, you know, it's really unrealistic, so we're going to work for, you know, nicer quarters for you. People who said, we are going to fight with you the entire way along. Those are the heroes, and, and, and I hope that we can look to them for, um, for inspiration. I want to, uh, I recognize, I know, I, I have to curb my, I, it's the professor's instinct, and I'll try to keep it, to limit myself. You know, I like Anna a lot, and we're not going to end up from this night being enemies. That's not possible, and I'm saying that because I want that to be clear. Because when I say I want to reach a broad public, if I lose Anna, then I think our cause is lost. Uh, so uh, I don't want there uh, to be any animus or hostility uh, resulting from this evening. It's just, it's a serious issue and serious, uh, we have to have a serious talk about it. Um, Anna keeps talking about rights, but rights is an abstract term. You have to define what you mean by rights. Palestinians talk about their right to self-determination. Yes, they have a right to self-determination. That's been validated under international law. The problem is that people take a right as in the right of self-determination to be a blank check that you can write anything into this right. No, the right is not just a principle. The right has been explicitly defined under international law. You may not like it, but the International Court of Justice, the United Nations Human Rights Organizations, they have defined the right of self-determination of Palestinians to mean the right of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza and East Jerusalem to a state side by side with Israel. It's not an abstract principle. It's a concretized right, and the right has been defined. Now, Anna invokes the example of apartheid in South Africa. 
And by implication, why don't we aim for the same thing? Because the answer is completely obvious if you know the history. When the South African government, the white South African government, tried to get around the international community's revulsion at apartheid, they tried to create these things called Bantu stands. And the Bantu stands were actually given full independence beginning in 1976 with Transkei, and then Siskei, then both with Botswana and so forth. When it came before the United Nations, the vote on recognizing the Bantu stands, the vote was 134 to zero. The US was the sole abstention. It was 134 to zero. It's exactly the same lopsided majority in the United Nations, the same lopsided majority than the case of Israel-Palestine calls for two states on the June 1967 border. So the obvious reason why you support two states in the June 67 border is the same reason you supported one state in South Africa, because that's what the international community deemed the reasonable, just, and legitimate resolution of the conflict. Uh, Norman, Anna, thank you so much. <laughs> The, the Baltzer-Finkelstein debate can, can continue outside uh, where both Norman and Anna will be signing their books. Witness in Palestine, Knowing Too Much, thank you again for coming.